Havre, April 9, 1803. Dear Sir, we arrived here yesterday in 29 days from the hook. The voyage was as favorable in other respects as it was in point of dispatch, having experienced no storm or other unpleasant incident in it. The seasickness of my family accepted. We remain today, but shall sit out tomorrow. For Paris having made the necessary arrangements for the purpose, and expect to arrive there the day after. Some circumstances have occurred here, which it is proper to mention. As soon as my arrival was known, a salute was fired from the fort, and a guard of an officer and 50 men ordered to my quarters. Immediately afterwards, the general commanding the troops called to pay their respects. I thought it best to permit two sentinels to be placed at the door, but declined the guard. This morning, the General of Marines and his etat major have paid a similar attention. If this is an ordinary ceremony of the military to persons in a public character, it is of little importance. But if it emanated from the government, it may be viewed in a more favorable light. I can form no opinion on the subject. A few days will explain it. I hear the troops destined for Louisiana, though sometimes since prepared, have not sailed. There is much talk of a war between France and Britain, but the prevailing opinion is it will not take place. Present me affectionately to the President, and be assured of the esteem with which I am your friend and servant. James Monroe James Monroe's return to France in 1803 was certainly an event to remember, as he noted in this letter to Secretary of State James Madison. Little did he know just how monumental the event would prove to be through the course of events in the next month. Before we get to that, though, I'd like to welcome you to the Presidencies of the United States. I'm your host, Jerry Landry. Special thanks to Robin for providing the intro quote for this episode. Due to a schedule conflict, I had to ask for a replacement at the last minute, and Robin stepped up and volunteered her voice for this task. Though Robin doesn't have a podcast, I'm glad to promote her as a great friend and colleague, and I can't thank her enough again. I wanted to take a second prior to plunging into the details of Monroe's mission to share a quick note about what lies ahead for us. This episode will mostly be focused on events in Europe and the Louisiana situation. In the next episode, I'd like to take a step back and look at the state of Native Americans around the time of the Louisiana Purchase, as this would prove to be a pivotal moment in the history of the Native Nations— arguably the largest since the beginning of the narrative of this podcast in the year 1789. Thus, it seemed like a good time to do a bit more of a deep dive than we've done to date. After that episode, we'll pick back up the narrative and continue our journey forward through Jefferson's first term. Honestly, I'm not sure how many more episodes we have before we get to his second inaugural. I'd like to say three or four, but there really was a great deal happening between April 9th, 1803 and March 4th, 1805. Rather than speculate, let's just move ahead and we'll see where the path leads us, shall we? Monroe's reception at Le Havre was much more cordial and less guarded than the one he had received nine years before when he assumed the post as U.S. minister just after the fall of Robespierre. He and his party proceeded on to Paris on the 10th, arriving two days later where they enrolled their daughter Eliza in school before Monroe began his work with U.S. Minister to France Robert R. Livingston. As noted by Monroe biographer Harry Ammond, quote, Once in Paris, the special envoy, i.e. Monroe, was surprised at his colleagues' indifferent greeting. As discussed last episode, Livingston saw the appointment of Monroe as a personal slight by the administration, as a lack of confidence in his abilities. It seems that it was not meant to be as such by either Jefferson or Madison, Indeed, as noted by Livingston biographer George Dangerfield, quote, the weakness of U.S. Minister to Spain Charles Pinckney at Madrid had been uppermost in Jefferson's and Madison's minds. But nonetheless, a personal criticism was how Livingston took it. Thus, there was no way he'd be rolling out the red carpet for his new colleague. Livingston had, in fact, been working to render Monroe's mission unnecessary. Since he had learned of Monroe's appointment as special envoy, Livingston had been, quote, scrambling about in a frantic effort to conclude an agreement before his colleague appeared. The day before Monroe arrived in Paris, 
Livingston was invited to a meeting with French Foreign Minister Talleyrand, which seemed to indicate that he had succeeded beyond his wildest dreams. During their meeting, Talleyrand, quote, casually asked if the United States would like to purchase all of Louisiana. Again, as discussed last episode, Talleyrand had up until this point been dismissive of Livingston's various proposals for purchasing this part or that part or any combination of Louisiana or the Floridas. Though the acquisition of New Orleans, or at least of the administrative control of New Orleans, had remained the one constant. As I'm sure we can all imagine that sense of disbelief that Livingston felt, we are also not surprised that he stumbled in his response. Rather than accepting immediately, Livingston instead said that the U.S. was only interested in New Orleans and the Floridas. Talleyrand asked what Livingston was willing to offer, and when he responded with a figure, quote, of 20 million livres, if France assumed all claims, Talleyrand declined the offer and told Livingston to think it over and come back the next day. As noted by Ammon, quote, it was only after he had left the foreign minister's office that Livingston realized the full significance of the proposal. This wasn't just Talleyrand finally being willing to negotiate. Talleyrand was the mouthpiece, but this abrupt change in policy was coming from French First Consul Napoleon Bonaparte himself. Hey, podcast listeners, I'm Paul Brandis introducing my podcast, Countdown to Dallas. It's a fascinating, in-depth look at the seemingly unconnected events that led to the assassination of President John F. Kennedy. It's based on my book of the same title. In that book and in this podcast, I go all the way back to 1939, when Lee Harvey Oswald was born into a troubled and dysfunctional family. I'll follow his transient and often violent teenage years and young adulthood, painting a fuller picture of the man who would later become Kennedy's killer. I also take a look at events unfolding in that era, like Cuba and Vietnam, And I'll unpack the conspiracy theories, too, not one of which has ever been conclusively proven. Subscribe to Countdown to Dallas at evergreenpodcasts.com or your favorite listening app, October 31st. Bonaparte had faced numerous challenges to his attempts to reinvigorate the French colonial empire in the Western Hemisphere. In early 1803, Jean-Jacques Dessalines had managed to consolidate his control over what was now being called the quote-unquote indigenous army of rebels and Saint-Domingue, and the new French military commander, General Donatien marie joseph de Rochambeau, was only succeeding in continuing to drive away non-whites who had previously supported the French cause through his inhumane tactics, which included having prisoners, quote, both military and civilian, burned alive, drowned in sacks, hung, crucified, asphyxiated by sulfur fumes in ships' holds, and shot after digging their shallow graves. Napoleon had already been forced to divert resources that were intended for the takeover of the Louisiana colony to Saint-Domingue, and it appeared that there was no end in sight for the conflict. Meanwhile, the first consul had looked at the situation in the Western Hemisphere and realized that if the Louisiana colony was to be secure, he needed to acquire more territory. As it stood, the southern part of Louisiana at the mouth of the Mississippi River would be sandwiched in between Mexican Tejas and the Floridas, both of which were Spanish possessions. Thus, Napoleon directed the French ambassador in Madrid to work to persuade the Spanish government to relinquish control of the Floridas. Despite the fact that the government had been struggling with domestic disputes and concern over King Carlos Cuatro's health, as he had suffered, quote, a stroke variously diagnosed as an attack of angina pectoris or epilepsy. The government of Pedro Savalos and the -the behind-the-scenes puppet master, Manuel de Godoy, was able to rebuff the French request by asserting that neither Britain nor the United States would accept the French taking control of the Floridas. Spain couldn't risk damaging their relations with either of those nations. On top of all of that, it was looking increasingly likely that war would resume before long in Europe. And when Napoleon did the math, it seemed like continuing on with his ambitions in Louisiana would only be yet another drain when he desperately needed funds and resources for other aims. If France was going back to war with Great Britain, Napoleon aimed to come out victorious, and he already had new ideas about how the Navy could play a key role in that. But these new ideas would also come with a large price tag. 
whether it was Livingston's persistence or the realization that Monroe's diplomatic mission meant that Jefferson was really serious, something ultimately came together in the first consul's mind. He had a large chunk of territory that he couldn't use and that the U.S. really wanted him to sell to them. Jefferson Bayer for Dumas Malone also points to another part of the political equation that led to Napoleon's decision to sell Louisiana, one that Jefferson and Madison had made a point to emphasize in their relations with the diplomatic representatives back in Washington. The Jefferson administration had been developing closer ties with Great Britain as their relations with France had turned troubled once more with the New Orleans situation. If France went back to war with Great Britain, there was a chance that the U.S. may side with the British or, at the very least, provide them with financial and material support. Selling Louisiana to the Americans would resolve the last major point of contention between the two nations and generate a great amount of goodwill in the government and the public of the United States. Politically, financially, and militarily, the sale of Louisiana made sense. As James Monroe neared Paris, Livingston made a last-ditch effort to make a deal with Talleyrand for Louisiana before his colleague arrived, and he had to share the credit. Livingston wrote Talleyrand a letter asking him to put, quote, in writing that France had decided to sell Louisiana in response to Livingston's representations and proposing that they begin work on a treaty without waiting for Monroe's presentation. He even went to Talleyrand's office to try to persuade him in person. Little did Livingston know that he was in yet another cat-and-mouse game with the French foreign minister. Though Talleyrand knew about the plans to sell Louisiana, he was not the person who had been empowered by Napoleon to negotiate. That duty fell to French Minister of the Treasury, Francois de Babet maubois Maubois was not a completely out-of-left-field choice for this duty, for, as noted by Ammon, quote, Marbois was on excellent personal terms with Livingston. He liked Americans, his wife was a Philadelphian, and he was not tainted with imputations of bribery. We should remember that this is only five years since the XYZ affair, after all, and Talleyrand had been right in the middle of that scandal. Thus, Talleyrand left Livingston's last-minute plea unanswered, and Monroe arrived in Paris to find a rather distant Livingston. As described by Monroe biographer Harry Ammond, quote, When Monroe met Livingston later in the day, he was astonished by Livingston's complete lack of interest in learning the latest views of the administration or in examining the instructions which Monroe had brought with him. Livingston wasn't quote-unquote overtly hostile, but his attention was focused on the small but still existent possibility that he may be able to complete an agreement without Monroe. Marbois approached Livingston shortly after Monroe's arrival in Paris and asked for a private conference. Though Monroe was suspicious of Livingston's going alone to meet with the Treasury Minister, as he had not been formally presented to and recognized as a special envoy by the French government, Livingston, as the formal representative of the United States government, paid Marbois a call that evening, and Marbois informed him of Napoleon's decision to sell Louisiana to the U.S. Though the first consul had named his price as 50 million francs, Marbois, when he told Livingston, doubled the figure and said that Bonaparte wanted 100 million francs for the colony. Livingston rebuffed this offer, and Marbois came back with a figure of 60 million. Livingston thought this still too high, and as the hour was growing late, they ended their conference, and Livingston returned his lodgings to draft a letter to Secretary of State Madison claiming that he, emphasis on he, Livingston, had made a major breakthrough in the negotiations. As he stated in his letter, quote, It is so very important that you should be apprised that a negotiation is actually opened even before Mr. Monroe has been presented in order to calm the tumult, which the news of war will renew, that I have lost no time in communicating it. Mm Mm-hmm. Sure, Livingston. We got you. Monroe got the gist of Livingston's treatment as well. But after he was presented at the Foreign Office on April 14th, he was somewhat official. He wouldn't be officially official until received at a monthly reception in which Napoleon himself would receive him. But Monroe was official enough to proceed with some business and wasn't one to take traveling across the Atlantic and putting himself and his family in greater financial risk only to be shut out of the mission he had been given lying down. Meanwhile, as Livingston Bauer for George Dangerfield wrote, quote, Livingston knew all too well that Monroe was the government's official spokesman. 
that he had only to set foot in Paris for all eyes to be turned upon him, that the credit for a triumph for which he himself had worked so persistently and in the face of such manifold discouragements would probably go to the man who had done nothing but arrive in Paris. By the very nature of their circumstances and positions, it was hard to imagine that the two wouldn't end up at odds. However, they were also two men who realized that they were serving a higher cause. And because of the sense of duty and responsibility, they had some frank discussions about their differences and came to an agreement for Monroe to be included in the negotiations moving forward. In their first joint proposal, Livingston and Monroe put forward to the French that they would not go any higher than 40 million livres on top of the settlement of remaining American claims against the French from the past that had yet to be resolved since the convention of Mortfontaine. Word of this offer was sent to Napoleon at the Chateau de Saint-Cloud, and the first consul was apparently not happy. Thus, the Americans upped the offer to 50 million livres, but Marbois warned them that they were playing with fire. He reminded them that Napoleon had originally wanted 100 million livres, and if he did not accept this offer of 50 million, quote, they would have to assume that the offer of Louisiana was withdrawn. The Americans held their ground, but then, one of the envoys ran aground health-wise. Monroe apparently took ill with a back injury, and thus, though Livingston attempted to keep up the negotiations, despite the concerns of other Americans on the diplomatic staff in Paris about this course of action, matters did grind to a near halt for a few days. On April 24th, Marbois was officially empowered as a minister plenipotentiary to negotiate with Livingston and Monroe, and Monroe was able to receive Marbois and Livingston at his lodgings, where, with Monroe reclining on a sofa, the three continued their talks. Marbois had two proposals, one that he said was from Napoleon, which he felt was, quote, hard and unreasonable, and one that he had drafted, but that he felt he could get Napoleon to sign off on. The two American envoys took Marbois' proposal and, after working with it some, met with the French minister at the Treasury on the 29th to present their counteroffer, 50 million livres, along with settling 20 million livres worth of American claims against France. Marbois, while indicating that he was satisfied with the amount for settling the claims, also asserted that the French needed a sum of 60 million livres in addition to settling 20 million livres worth of claims to make the deal go through. There was no way that the U.S. would be able to pay all of that up front, so Marbois agreed to an arrangement where it could be paid through, quote, the issuance of stock bearing 6% interest, which the French government could sell in the open market. Livingston and Monroe, accepting that this was the best that they were going to get, agreed, and Marbois took this proposal to Napoleon the next day. Now, I think we all know how this ended up, but there is a point that I think is important to note here. Namely, there was still the issue of the Floridas, which led into a larger issue of what exactly was meant by Louisiana. U.S. Minister of Spain Charles Pinckney had only been given the language of the Third Treaty of San Aldefonso, which transferred Louisiana from Spain to France on March 31st, and he had sent this on to Livingston on April 4th. In the treaty, Louisiana was described as follows, quote, The colony or province of Louisiana, with the same extent that it now has in the hands of Spain, and that it had when France possessed it. Livingston had originally sought more specific language that, if France acquired Florida, it would transfer it over to the United States. But as this idea was rebuffed by Marbois, he now wanted this language that vaguely described Louisiana inserted into the final treaty as he felt that it may give them a claim on at least West Florida. Monroe at first resisted, wanting more specific language about Florida, but finally concluded that, quote, we must not lose time. The best they could get from the French on the Florida issue was an assurance that France would support them in negotiations with Spain on the matter. Also of note, on May 1st, James Monroe was finally fully recognized as a special envoy at the official presentation at the Tuileries, and Monroe and Livingston dined with First Consul Napoleon Bonaparte. The meeting was awkward and the conversation strained, but it was cordial enough. The next day, the treaty, which was dated April 30th, was signed, and pending ratification, Louisiana whatever that was, was now a part of the United States. With a few pen strokes, the size of the United States doubled. Believe me, there will be plenty of details to sort out with that. 
but it could at least be seen by those present for the signing as a good move forward for both nations. Speaking of moving forward, on May 4, 1803, Rufus King took his formal leave of British King George III. King had remained at his post as U.S. Minister in London long enough to be able to convey news of the Louisiana Purchase to the British government and to reassure them that the American envoys, in their negotiation of the treaty, quote, had taken care not to infringe upon any British right to the navigation of the Mississippi. Though King approved of the work of Livingston and Monroe in their negotiations and appreciated the importance, quote, to secure advantages so important as those which depend upon the complete navigation and control of the River Mississippi, he also expressed a concern about, quote, the great extension of territory that the purchase gave the U.S. That was a concern for another day, though as King had to finish up all the arrangements for him and his family to leave London. On the morning of May 18th, he, his wife Mary, and their two youngest sons departed London, bound for Cowles on the Isle of Wight. There, they boarded the John Morgan and began a 40-day journey across the Atlantic. When they arrived in New York Harbor and King departed the ship, he was greeted by, quote, the cheers of several thousand welcomers and curiosity seekers. After seven years abroad, at the end of June 1803, Rufus King was finally home. Meanwhile, back in Paris, though Louisiana had been secured, James Monroe's mission was not at an end, as he and Livingston needed to make heads or tails of what the situation was with West Florida, as that would determine whether Monroe needed to travel to Madrid. Thus, the two would delve into research on the history of Louisiana to try to determine what exactly the U.S. had. Monroe wrote to Madison on May 18th that, quote, Since the conclusion of the treaty with France for the purchase of Louisiana, I feel much at a loss what part to take respecting the Floridas. The cession of Louisiana by France to the United States must lessen the value of the Floridas to Spain, and she will be apt to feel that effect more st- and she will be apt to feel that effect more sensibly immediately after she hears it than at any other time. It may be advisable to exchange a portion of Louisiana next to Mexico for the Floridas, and I have no power to make such an arrangement. I am of opinion that it is more in conformity to the spirit of my instructions and the interest of my country that I should proceed immediately to Madrid to endeavor to obtain the Floridas, then remain inactive and suffer the favorable occasion which is now presented to be lost. The acquisition of the Floridas is an important object with our government, as is sufficiently shown by our instructions. However, by June 7th, Monroe had changed his mind and wrote a letter to Madison in which he enclosed, quote, a view which I have taken of the question whether West Florida is comprised in the session lately made to the United States by France of Louisiana in which I am led to conclude that it is. Indeed, I think that the doctrine is too clear to admit of any doubt. The bargain is proportionally a more advantageous one to us. West Florida was still not all of Florida, though, and Monroe admitted that, quote, I have still great difficulty in deciding whether I ought to proceed immediately to Spain or remain here till I hear from you, after you have become acquainted with what has been concluded with France. Ultimately, Monroe decided not to go and would spend four months in France before moving on to, well, we'll get to that in due time. His time in France would not be an idle time, though, as Monroe used the opportunity to catch up with some old friends, including the Marquis de Lafayette and Tadus Kosciusko. Livingston was busy in this period as well. The U.S. minister to France wrote to Madison on his own a couple of weeks before Monroe, asserting that he felt that the U.S., with the Louisiana Purchase, had a legal right to all lands to the Perdido River, otherwise known as West Florida, but that with everything else going on, East Florida was of little worry to anyone and, quote, may be yours whenever you please. At the same time, Livingston was sending letters to King, providing him with ammunition that he could distribute as he saw fit once he arrived back stateside as to how he, not Monroe, had convinced the French to sell Louisiana to the U.S. Livingston, however, was not subtle in his attempts to shape the story of the Louisiana Purchase to his benefit. In a draft of a joint message to U.S. Minister of Spain Charles Pinckney about the purchase, 
Monroe caught where Livingston had tried to pinpoint April 8th as the date that Napoleon had decided to sell Louisiana to the U.S., which would have been before Napoleon knew of Monroe's arrival in France. Though Monroe let that one slide, on June 8th, Monroe sent to Madison an open letter to be passed along to the U.S. Senators from Virginia, in which he made his case for his role in the matter, asserting that the decision to sell Louisiana was not made until after his arrival was known. As this would be an ongoing point of contention between the two envoys, we'll leave the matter here for the time being, as, by June 1803, there was much larger news circulating than a squabble between the two Americans. After the proclamation by British King George III on March 8, 1803, calling for the British armed forces to be readied, as discussed last episode, French First Consul Napoleon flew into a rage while meeting with the British ambassador to France, Charles Whitworth, at the Tuileries Palace. As described by Charles John Federac, quote, In front of a large audience, Napoleon began a long and loud diatribe against the British government and Whitworth personally. He exclaimed to all the foreign ministers that the British wanted war, and he would give it to them. Though Talleyrand tried to smooth out the situation, there was little that could be done to pull either side back from the brink. The British Foreign Secretary, Lord Hawkesbury, put forward a proposal for a revision to the Treaty of Amiens that would, quote, allow the British to occupy Malta for six years, after which they would hand it to the Maltese. In return, the British would recognize Bonaparte as the head of his new territories in northern Italy. Napoleon's government rejected this proposal outright, and the British position continued to harden. Whitworth asked for his passports, and, despite Talleyrand's best efforts to keep him from leaving, departed from Paris on May 12th. By mid-May, it was clear that war was an inevitability. And six days after Whitworth's departure, quote, a British frigate opened fire on a French convoy in the Channel, restarting a conflict that had only just been peacefully resolved a year prior. We'll have to wait to see what this means for the state of affairs in Europe and with American relations with the belligerent nations, for we are heading west next episode with a look at the state of the native peoples of North America. As we've already covered, the indigenous nations by the beginning of the 19th century had already dealt with much change, much of which had proven detrimental to the continuation of their ways of life, and little did they know that with the transfer of Louisiana to the United States, there was much more in store. I hope you'll join me next time. Until then, I'd like to thank Robin again for providing the intro quote for this episode. Special thanks also to friends of the podcast, The Itinerant Band, who have graciously allowed me to use clips from their rendition of Jefferson and Liberty as our intro and outro music. You can find more information about The Itinerant Band and, of course, this podcast on the website, presidencies.blueberry, that's B-L-U-B-R-R-Y dot com. If you have any questions or comments, you can reach me via email at presidenciespodcast, that's all one word, at gmail.com. Or you can reach out via social media. I'm available on Facebook at Presidencies, on Twitter at Presidencies89, or on Instagram at Presidencies Podcast. again, all one word. Just a reminder that I will be making another live appearance in a few months. If you're in or are going to be in the Philly area on Saturday, May 2nd, I will be presenting at History Camp Philadelphia. I'll share more information through here as well as on social media as it gets closer. But mark your calendars, and if you'd like to register, just go to historycamp.org. There are already many great sessions listed that I'm looking forward to attending, in addition to sharing information about the intersection of faith and the presidencies with the audience at my session. Special thanks to all of you who have supported the podcast through various means, be it leaving a rating and review on iTunes, fulfilling books listed on the wish list linked on the website, or by sharing information about the podcast with others. This journey through presidential history is not a solo one, and I hope that you know how much I appreciate each of you. Thanks for listening, and until next time, take care, dear friends. Mad Magazine, advertising mascots, B-movie posters, and cartoons. 
Oh yeah, I can't forget cartoons. If you get the funky connection that ties these pop culture gems together, you'll dig two designers walk into a bar. See, we're a couple of creatively curious pals living between the bookends of grand museums and dive bars. Hey, you know the place, the sweet spot where highbrow and lowbrow become drinking buddies. So join our barroom chats as we talk influential work and uncover stories of how the familiar became iconic. Think behind the music for the stuff we love. Check out our website at two designers walk into a bar.com and listen wherever you get your podcasts or visit evergreenpodcasts.com.